morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are continuing our work on S-119 and actually relating to statewide use of force uh, standard for law enforcement. And going to welcome attorney Bryn Hare to do a walkthrough on our uh, latest draft, which is on our committee page. And uh, let me make sure I get the draft number. So 2.4, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. All right, thank okay. you. Okay, so good morning committee for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council, um, walking through draft number 2.4 of S219. Um, I'm gonna pop through it pretty quickly um, since I know there are some witnesses with time constraints, um, but obviously I'll, um, I'll pause for any questions. So all of the changes that, are, um, that have been made to this version from the previous version that you looked at, which was 1.1, are highlighted in yellow. So I'm um, going to jump through based on the yellow highlight. <clears throat> so the first change is on page one, lines 11 through 13. Um, we've added another definition to the list of definitions um, to define the word force. So that just means the physical coercion that's employed by law enforcement to compel a person's compliance with the law enforcement officer's instructions. The next change is lower down on page one um, we've changed the word harm to threat. So an imminent threat isn't merely a fear of future harm. Um, it was originally an imminent harm and that was the way the definition was uh, written in the California statute. But um, uh, somebody pointed it out, I think it was Representative Lalonde pointed out that it was, uh, didn't make a lot of sense in that context since what, you're, what we're, this word, what this term is defining is imminent threat, um, not imminent harm. So we made that change. I'm gonna scroll down to page two now. Um, and I'm gonna describe the changes to the totality of the circumstances definition. So this has been reworded um, and also the factors listed underneath have changed pretty significantly. So now um, this reads that the totality of the circumstances means the conduct and decisions of law enforcement leading up to the use of force and all facts that are known or should have been known to law enforcement at the time. So those facts may include, um, and then the factors here that have changed are subdivision B here, the conduct of the subject that's being, um, being confronted as reasonably perceived to the officer at the time, including whether the subject is physically or mentally impaired in a manner that interferes with the person's um, ability to understand or comply with law enforcement's commands. So that, um, the, the, that was formerly two factors that has um, sort of been condensed and reworded into one. I'm going to scroll down to page three now. Um, and this is another factor in subdivision E at the top of page three. Um, if you remember, this is the factor that had to do with some personal characteristics of um, the law enforcement officer and the subject. And the change here is to remove the skill level and training of the officer. And then subdivision F, if you recall, that was uh, originally I'm the sorry, subdivision. Excuse me. Um I'm sorry, um, I see Tom has his hand up. Excuse me, thank you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> uh, going back to uh, page two, total totality of the circumstances, um, I guess, and I think we've discussed things like this before, but um, what does it mean that, uh, that should have known uh, to the law enforcement officer? Right, so that is, um, uh, that's going to be a standard that the court will interpret what facts the law enforcement officer should have known. So um, essentially you're broadening that, broadening that uh, definition a little bit to include those facts that law enforcement did know or facts that law enforcement should have known. And that will be, um, an, that will be um, up to the fact finder to determine what facts law enforcement should have known. So not being a lawyer, so, so could that change as time goes on, depending on case law? Um, what that standard means? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a, it's a pretty factually specific uh, inquiry, what, sh what facts the law enforcement officer should have known. Um, so I think it will be dependent on each individual situation and it could change over time, yes. Wow, okay, thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Oh, my hand wasn't working, but now it is. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so th that should have known standard, would that uh, 
bring in the reasonable law enforcement officer from the perspective of a reasonable law enforcement officer? Yes, yeah, so that's typically the way those uh, inquiries are made is what facts should have been known to a reasonable person or in this situation, a reasonable law enforcement officer. That is typically right, how that inquiry is done by the courts. I don't see any other hands up. Okay. Okay. So I'll go back to page three, um, subdivision F. Um, that subdivision was formally that sort of broad category of any environmental factors or exigent circumstances. Um, and that has been removed. And instead, um, we've got another, a new, a different factor here, which is whether the subject has access to a, a weapon and the proximity of that weapon. So that is new language there that falls under the totality of the circumstances. I'll move down to. Um, sorry, excuse me, Tom has his hand up. Oh, I didn't realize I hit it. I was thinking about it, but I guess I did hit it. And that's fine. I, I will uh, ask a question before we move on. Um, and I probably should have asked this before when we'd gone through this uh, uh, previously, but E, factors such as the age, size, relative strength of the officer and the subject. I have no idea why that would even matter. Um, and, and if somebody could explain it to me, I guess, in, in, a, in a situation where you're more or less thinking on your feet, I, 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 I just don't understand why, why? <laughs> and, and I don't expect that, uh, um, you, Bryn, to have an answer to that. I mean, that's, I know that's not your job to answer that question, but if somebody could explain to me why E is even relevant. So, not RC, your hand up, but did you want to respond to Tom? I can, I can, can I jump in? Sure. Yeah. Can I jump to Tom? Is that all right? Um, so, it really goes back to if there's a huge, size difference between the officer and who they're confronting. So, you know, for example, you have me, I'm, I'm not tall at all, and I'm, you know, not a particularly big person, but if I'm facing off with somebody who's six foot five and has a background in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, then it, it's going to be a different standard we're not a different standard, but you know, the circumstances are going to be different for me in terms of what level of force having to confront this person. If that clears it up a little bit for you. Uh, a little bit, but no matter what, wouldn't the level of force uh, used would be to, on some level, subdue uh, the, the other person? It, it would be, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, to me... I'm, he, I'm just saying that there's there's a difference. In... No, I, I understand what you're saying as far as that size difference goes. I mean, you're definitely going to have to react differently to to somebody yeah. who, who's, who's 6'5", 250 than you are, uh, say, even somebody that's uh, uh, smaller than you are. Um, but it, it's still it's still the maximum level that you need to um, react. But anyway. Yeah, I'm going to, and actually before we uh, get back to Bryn, I wanna check in with um, Rob Appel. I, good morning, I know you need to leave. Good morning. Point. What time do you, no. can you be with us? Um, I think, I think, Lori and Demis have coordinated with me so I can be in um, testifying to house health care when I'm done here. So I'm not terribly pressured for time and I won't be very long, I don't think. Okay. So it would right. be helpful for me to hear the rest of Bryn's presentation and might make my, my comments even shorter. So okay. Well, we do have another witness that can only be with us till about 11.15. So I just want to make sure we get Yeah, I, okay. I, like I said, I don't think I'll be very long at all. Okay. Thank you. Though. Okay, go ahead, Bryn. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, not or, oh, your hand is down. Okay, great. Got it. Okay, so I'm um, still on page three, subdivision B. Uh, I'm now under use of force. 
So you'll see that uh, the words of law enforcement were added to that subdivision one under the use of force subsection. Um, and that's just to make it clear that we're talking about it's law enforcement's authority that we're talking about to use physical force. So the next change is on page four. Um, if everyone can scroll down to page four, subdivision four. Um, this is the um, this is the subsection that talks about um, what is objectively reasonable and whether the decision to use force is objectively reasonable. So we've added, added a sentence here to subdivision four that provides that um, the failure of law enforcement to use feasible and reasonable alternatives to force shall be a consideration for whether or not, um, or for whether its use was objectively reasonable. So it adds um, a sentence clarifying that objectively reasonable determination. I'm gonna, now I'm scrolling down to subdivision six on the same page. So this is that, um, this subdivision six describes when force is proportional. Um, and if you recall, the last sentence provided that the more immediate the threat and the more likely the threat would result in death or serious bodily injury, the greater the level of force that may be proportional. So we've just removed that, um, those words, objectively reasonable and necessary to counter it. So to make it clear that this is really a description of what proportional force means and not what objectively reasonable or necessary mean in this context. For once, it's not my dog barking. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna scroll down to page five. Um, so this is some new language you'll find on page five, subdivision B. And this refers back to um, that sentence that we just looked at with respect to what is objectively reasonable. And this provides that when it's feasible, law enforcement shall determine whether a subject's conduct is the result of a medical condition, mental impairment, developmental disability, physical limitation, language barrier, drug or alcohol impairment, or other factor beyond the subject's control. And if, and it provides specifically that if officer determines that that subject's conduct is in whole or in part, the result of a factor that was listed in the subdivision, that the officer has to take that information into account in determining the amount of force that's appropriate to use on the subject, if any. So this language um, sort of replaces those uh, specific factors in the totality of the circumstances definition that was found in draft 1.1 and provides some more specific directives to law enforcement in their interactions with um, individuals who may be experiencing uh, either um, a medical condition or a mental impairment um, that may diminish their ability to respond to an officer, um, an officer's instructions. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here, so I'm gonna keep going to subdivision eight. Um, and this language, even though it's highlighted in yellow, is not new. Um, this was formerly found in subdivision C. This is the language that provides that law enforcement um, don't lose the right to self-defense uh, by the use of proportional force if it's in compliance with um, subdivision B2. Um, and instead it's just, it's been moved from the use of deadly force subsection C to B, so it applies uh, throughout um, the use of force or the use of deadly force. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna move on now to um, the next change, which can be found on page seven. So if you scroll down to page seven, this is the prohibited restraint language. Um, and it, we have this draft reverts to the Senate version of prohibited restraint. So it provides that law enforcement shall not use a prohibited restraint on a person for any reason. So if you, this is different from draft 1.1, which provided that law enforcement may use a prohibited restraint under certain circumstances. So a little lower down on page seven, you'll see that there, um, that the standard here cross-references um, the justifiable homicide statute, which in draft 1.1 was um, that portion that, that um, was with respect to law enforcement was repealed. In this draft, draft 2.4, um, that subdivision C of the justifiable homicide statute is not repealed and instead it's amended. So we'll get to that in se section two. 
Um, but, uh, excuse me, Brent, I, I'm sorry, I see Tom's hand is up. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah, it, me again. <laughs> so uh, uh, page seven, six, a law enforcement officer shall not use a prohibited restraint on a person for any reason. Um, but what, uh, how does that affect on page five, number eight, uh, where it says self-defense by the use of proportional force? You still, uh, uh, the, so with self-defense by use of proportional force, you still can't use one of those uh, uh, prohibited restraints? Right, so you'll see um, the next subdivision I'm gonna talk about is this language that makes it clear, um, sort of sets forth in no uncertain terms that law enforcement doesn't lose their right to self-defense um, or a justifiable homicide defense if um, they use force or deadly force in a manner that's in compliance with these standards. So um, that is subdivision eight. So um, that, is, that language there is intended to make it clear that um, because actually not just the prohibited restraint, but the whole, this, um, the whole, this whole standard um, related to law enforcement use of force doesn't um, interfere with or diminish uh, law enforcement's ability to raise a common law self-defense defense or a justifiable homicide defense. Okay. So uh, uh, potentially they could use one of the prohibited restraints? Um, if it was, if their use of force- Certain, Depending in, on circumstances. Right, in yeah. compliance with the standards that are set forth in this new section of law. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to section two then. <clears throat> so this, if you recall, draft 1.1, Section two um, was the prohibited restraint crime that was passed in S219. Um, and that has been removed in this version because um, what this draft does is it leaves that prohibited restraint crime as it existed in 219 as it stands. And instead, section two amends the justifiable homicide statute. I'm having a lot of background noise here, so I'm gonna move and be back with you in about 10 seconds. I think that'll be helpful for everybody so you don't have to listen to that. It's that time of year chainsaws are running. Sorry, everybody. I hope that's a little bit better. Great. Thank okay. you. Um, so I'll carry on with section two, which is 13 BSA 2305, the justifiable homicide statute. And as I mentioned, the earlier version repealed subdivision C of the statute. And this version instead takes that whole statute and sort of um, um, pretty significantly amends subsection C, but also makes some um, updates to the language in subdivision one. Um, so it provides that um, a person who kills or wounds another um, is guiltless in the just and necessary defense of the person's own life or the life of the person's spouse, parent, child, brother, sister, guardian, or ward. So it removes those words, master, mistress, and servant from subdivision one. Um, subdivision two just re, um, repositions those words forceful or violent to make it clear that they um, are those words apply to all of these different crimes that are listed in, the, in this subdivision. So in the forceful or violent suppression of a person attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, burglary or robbery. By moving those words, it makes it clear that it doesn't just apply to the last um, crime in that list. And then the top of page eight is subdivision three. <clears throat> so this is the section that applies to law enforcement. So um, this language has been 
pretty um, significantly amended to provide that in the case of a law enforcement officer using force or deadly force in compliance with 20 VSA 2368, which is the standard created by this bill. So it essentially provides this justifiable um, homicide it does apply to law enforcement as long as law enforcement's use of force is in compliance with the standards that you've created. And then lastly is the effective date that should be section three, not section four. Um, and so those repeals that were in section two and the previous draft are, are no longer there because um, rather than doing the repeal, um, you're just amending the justifiable homicide statute. Great, thank you, Brynn. I'm just uh, looking to see. I'm not seeing any, not seeing any hands. Nope. Uh, <laughs> actually, Tom. <you're>, yep. <laughs> okay. Great. Go um. Ahead. Oh, let's see. Where am I here? Uh, in the. Uh, in the forceful or violent suppression of a person attempting to commit murder, sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, burglary, or robbery, um, he or she shall be guiltless. What if somebody was attacking uh, another and their their whole uh, um, um, reason for doing it is they are just trying to maim the person, disfigure their face, and, and what if the only way to stop them is uh, um, forceful or violent suppression? I, I just oh, think dear. it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous just to, to limit um, uh, um, the, the suppression to these very few um, crimes. What well, page you on, sorry. Uh, uh, page seven, right at the bottom of the page, number section two. Yeah. Okay. Page seven, right at the bottom, number two. Yep. I agree anyway, with that, you. I mean, there's going to be, uh, and that's the only one I can think of. I got to believe there would be other um, um, situations where somebody's being attacked that a forceful or violent suppression may be um, warranted. So just so to be what? clear, this is existing law. Um, so that there, it, we have moved those words around, but it doesn't change the meaning of the statute. Um, that is what is currently provided for in the justifiable homicide statute. So it's a question you know, for the committee whether or not they'd like to um, expand that. It, it, right, right, yeah. It just seems awful narrow to me um, when there could be I, I don't know how many other situations. That's the only one I could think of. But maybe it would go back to uh, maiming that we discussed a few years ago. I, I don't know. Also, to be clear, there is also a, a just the general self-defense um, defense that exists at common law. So this um, there is beyond the justifiable homicide statute. There's also self-defense. Okay, great. Which Thank you. More broadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. All right. So um, I see two more hands, and then um, I'm going to uh, move to Zariah um, Hightower, Hightower um, next because she needs to leave at 11:15. Sure. So just be mindful of making sure that we that we get to her. So um, Selena, and then Ken. Sure. And that, um, I think my my I'll do, I'll say my question and. Um, but it may be more for Martin and committee discussions. So if Bryn has anything to weigh in now, great. And if not, we could just save that for um, committee discussion when we get to that. I'm just wondering about the decision to totally eliminate the new crime up for um, using the prohibited restraint. And if there um, is a reason to, I mean, is there a logistical or legal reason to do that? Or was it more just a choice to, to do that? Um, is it somehow at odds with the justifiable homicide defense in any way? 
Could you could will you repeat the first part? I didn't hear it. To to rem, did you say to remove it? To My understanding is from the Senate version, we removed. They created a new crime for use of a prohibited restraint, and this version removes. Okay, so that was my uh, that. Am I misunderstanding my, that? Yeah, and I may not have been clear. The, it was a little tricky because it appeared in version 1.1 of the bill as if it were all new language. But remember that um, that new crime passed in S219. So um, that because it has been removed from this version doesn't mean we're we're. Oh, okay. So it still exists. We're not. We're okay. Correct. Thank you. I really appreciate that clarity. That's it. Okay, Ken. So I'm just with Tom that I have uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, thought going into why we're, why it's so limited on what he was talking about on the bottom of page seven. Um, and then that's it for now. I, I just want that out there. I'll be talking a lot more later. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Great, Brynn, anything else before we move to our witnesses? Nope, that's it for me, thank you. Okay, great, all right, well, thank you very much. Okay, welcome, um, Soraya, good to see you. I'm sorry that we're only leaving you a little more than 15 minutes, but um, you're welcome back if we don't get through your testimony. Go ahead, thank you. No worries, I am not usually one to speak for very long, so that will be more time than I need. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Zoraya Hightower. I'm the Ward 1 City Councilor in Burlington, Vermont, and appreciate you all having me. Uh, I'm going to take a step back. I won't go as much into some of the language. I think you all have much more legal counsel that will be much more useful in digging through some of that. I'm going to just take a step back. Um, and as I'm sure the community is aware I'm going to start with this just being deeply necessary, both just in terms of law officers in the United States killing far more people than their counterparts in other wealthy democracies within those numbers, us seeing over and over again great racial disparities, and those being directly related to a policy reliance on fear as a reason for violence, and that persistent fact that historically American society and the, um, our police departments as well tend to fear black and brown men. As you know, currently many of the policies that govern police behavior use vague and unrestrictive language, lacking in harm minimization and life preserving strategies, enabling and even encouraging brutality. Um, as you I'm sure also know, given that you're considering this as when a police department has more restrictive policies on use of force, it's safer for both civilians and the officers who are seeking to protect the community. And so for me, this is incredibly important because I'm sure as you all know, right now we have dozens of people camping in the heart of Burlington and marching through our streets demanding among other things that three of our officers be fired. And I think all three of those cases, two in particular, shows that there's a wide gulf between what our system currently allows and even trains or encourages and what our community finds acceptable. And I definitely personally feel a strong need to do something to reduce that gulf, but as a municipal um, elected official, I do feel like I have limited resources. So I am looking to you all to make those changes. Um, I think there's definitely a difference between um, a department policy and a statute in terms of likelihood to change behavior and to be implemented. And therefore, I feel like my resources are to potentially change department policy. I don't think that that is, has been shown to be as effective as both in terms of um, reducing the actual, reducing violent behavior and then because of that, then making both civilians and officers safer. Um, the other thing is, <laughs> um, as if this comes from the legislature, it would do a lot to not amplify tensions between local law enforcement and local government, which right now in Burlington are extremely high. And so having this come from the state would be very useful because, I mean, just yesterday we had an emergency council meeting and even having general discussions around oh, what, are, what does severance look like is just so fraught because it's very clear on a very individual level who we're talking about. And it, it creates a lot of tension and a lot of 
negative feedback loops that play out in very real ways, I think, on actual streets. Um, and then I think the third advantage is it's great to have consistency in terms of what constituents can expect. As we all know, there's people who live in Burlington, but work in other places and vice versa, or we just come into Burlington to visit. And to the extent that we can align, you know, the Burlington Police Department, the UVM Police, the Chittenden County Sheriff's Department, the Vermont State Police, to make sure that all of those are following the same standard, the more I think we can get some of those benefits in terms of what, how, um, somebody who's being apprehended by an officer may react based on what expectation they have. So that's kind of my general thoughts on how, why I think that this is so incredibly important to municipalities. Um, a few things, the two comments that I did have on the language is I think on page seven lines, 16 through 17, you all did a great job of changing some of that language. I would also change brother and sister to sibling. And then on page three, and I'm sorry, I did that in reverse order of the pages that the actual page order is, um, would love to have you all engage in a discussion and have a strong opinion on this, on what it means to be evaluated carefully and thoroughly, both for, um, kind of more for all of the various police departments um, that we may have or sheriff's departments and so on, all of the law enforcement bodies that we have in our um, state and what that actually means. And if there is a definition elsewhere, or if there is, it maybe would be useful to define that here. Thank you all so much. Hey, thank you very much. I, that was helpful. I really, really appreciate your, your point of view and testimony. Thank you. Uh, Helpful hearing from somebody from a, a city council. Uh, any questions? Barbara, looks like you're. <laughs> Maybe. Right. Barbara, do you have a question? I do. Yes. So, um, Zariah, thank you so much for coming. I know you had a really late night and um, your insights were super helpful and your suggestions. I'm wondering if this were in place, do you think it would have made a difference in the situation we're facing right now? Or do you think there's something else that will need further action? Well, there definitely are things that will need further action um, in upcoming, the next legislative session. But I'm just wondering if anything jumps out at you. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is going to be very much my personal opinion, um, but I do think that specifically, I think definitely two of the instances, if we had had a different policy, would, of the three that um, the city is having such a strong dialogue, dialogue about right now, would not have, I don't think they would have happened if this would have been both in place and um, enforced. And so, um, Yes, I definitely think that the majority of the cases that we see like this would, where the community has such different feelings than the um, law enforcement would be mitigated. And it's really interesting because um, one of our witnesses the other day said that Burlington has a really great policy on the books, but it's not being followed. And so I don't know if you, agree with that statement, but it does seem like, as you said, a policy, there are fewer teeth in um, enforcing breaking a policy or where a law, obviously there are sharper teeth. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with that statement. I think what we see in Burlington too is we have, I, well, one, we have a pretty progressive law enforcement body in its own, and I want to give credit to that, which is why we kind of have progressive policies along with having progressive community, progressive um, government. But yes, I definitely think that that doesn't always play out. And there's so many conf policies conflict with all other kinds of things like union contracts and things like that in the ways that a state statute can overrule much more easily. Right, and I think you raised a really important point for not only Burlington, but other small towns that are even smaller, that it becomes more sort of personal and contentious on a local level. And people in Bristol should have the same rights as the people in Burlington, et cetera. So 
thank you for, thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Just making sure I'm not missing anybody else. Oh, okay. I think so. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming. Great. Okay. Uh, Rob Appel. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to comment on your good work here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am an attorney in private practice now in Chittenden County. I worked for the state for 30 plus years in a variety of roles, mostly in criminal defense and civil rights enforcement. So with that, uh, 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 I'll say enough. That's all I want, need to say about me. About uh, Rob? Yeah. Yeah, uh, you're, you're breaking up. Uh, so oh, we can't no. understand you. And, and I wonder if you could maybe shut your video off and, and that usually helps. Well, thank you. I don't want to be broken. No. See if I can do that. <laughs> no, of course, now we're he I'm hearing you fine, but. <laughs> well, let me try getting closer. Is that, am I, am I more audible now? Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know if it had anything to do with that, but it, it was just like an electronic breakup, but, but you seem to be fine now for whatever reason, so. All right. I'll keep my voice up. Let me know if I fade again. Okay, please. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, section one, I'm glad to see this definition of force added. However, I wonder why uh, it's not conforming with the definition of physical force that was just enacted in S219. It's a, it's a definition that exists. It's two sections away in Title 20. I think you should be consistent in, in, in that language. I can, I pulled it and can send it to Bryn or whoever. It's, it's easy enough to find. It's now 2366 uh, small e5, just to conform the, the two definitions. Um, page two, um, section, and I, I, and I commented yesterday on this um, to your chair and some others. Uh, lines 14 to 17, um, the conduct, I'm looking at 14 uh, to 17, the conduct of the subject being confronted is reasonably perceived by the officer at the time to include whether the subject is physically or mentally impaired in a manner that interferes with the subject's ability to understand or comply with law enforcement commands. I do note that later in the bill, you make a reference to developmental disability, but I think you also need to say it here because persons with developmental disabilities are not necessarily either physically or mentally impaired. They're just who they are. So um, I, think, I think some reference to, it's not an impairment, it's more of a condition. So I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but I do think it's important to include uh, the concept of developmental disability because we have had instances in the past where uh, a person who does not who it's you know intellectual disability or communication issues is unable or uh, unwilling to unable basically to respond to a, a command by a, a law enforcement officer and ends up getting tased we don't want that um yeah Bar excuse me barbara i see your hand is up Thank you. So, Robert, you raised a really good point, and that made me wonder about other situations where it is not an impairment or a disability, like um, not an English language speaker or yeah. um, hearing, impaired, hearing impaired. Or, yeah. There's language later in the bill that, that covers some of that. Um, it's on page five talks about developmental disability, physical limitation, language barrier, drug or alcohol impairment, or other factor beyond the subject's control. So, I mean, the concept in, in part of the bill, but I think it's very important to insert those broader concepts into this provision in the definition section. Thank you. Okay. Um, moving on, I'm now on page three, use of force, subsection two. And I, this came up yesterday. I was looking at the pursuit policy from the South Burlington Police Department, vehicle pursuit. And there, and I think this is pretty common in law enforcement agencies these days that 
Uh, the use of force and the degree of pursuit is dependent on the seriousness of the offense alleged or observed. You have no differentiation here. There is no um, a law enforcement, I'm reading 12 through 15. An officer shall only use the force objectively reasonable, necessary, and proportional to effect an arrest, prevent escape, or to overcome the resistance of a person the officer has reasonable cause to believe has committed any crime. That's my substitution for a crime while protecting life and safety of all persons. So without any further explanation, a, an officer could use extreme force to arrest somebody for disorderly conduct for refusing a command to stop blocking a roadway. Again, I don't think that's the, in the intent of the body, but without some differentiation as to either misdemeanor or felony level offense or violent and non-violent non offenses, I think, you're, you, I think it needs a little more work. I think um, this is overly broad and I don't have at this time any proposed language, but I encourage the committee to discuss that issue. Uh, Martin, I see your hand up. Yeah, a question about that. Um, so don't we capture that in the totality of the circumstances where one of those circumstances is the seriousness of the crime or suspected offense? And, and, and the totality of circumstances uh, certainly are go into the evaluation under subsection B2 that we're speaking about right now. Uh, would you refer me, please? To... It's on uh, page page two, line thirteen. It's one yeah, of the okay, totality of circumstances issues, and and the concept is certainly that would be needed to be a consideration for uh, necessary proportional use of force. Seriousness of the crime conduct. Um, oh, that's the comment. That's the section I just commented on. All right. right. I'm not as familiar with the, the, the structure of this bill as you are, obviously. You've worked with it a lot. Um, maybe you want to insert totality of the circumstances to refer back, just to make that link. Shall so use only the force objectively uh, necessary, proportional, given the totalitary totalitary of the so, circumstances to affect an arrest, just, just to make sure that linkage is there. Yeah, I, and I think the way that uh, just, uh, you know, the way that it's structured, we can consider this certainly is that that subsection two that we're looking at right now, line 12 to 15 is kind of the overarching. And then the next paragraphs, particularly four, five, and six, essentially are talking a little bit about each of those elements, objectively reasonable, the necessary element, the proportional element. And in each of those paragraphs, it does uh, connect up to the totality of the circumstances. But I take, right. your, I take your input and we'll certainly talk to legislative counsel to see if that also would help to clarify. Thank you. Um, uh, in, in connection with your vice chair's comment on justifiable homicide and, and, and ledge council saying that that's current language, I, it doesn't include aggravated assault, which would get you to maiming, et cetera. That may be a short shortcut. Um, I just want to make sure any other comments I, I raised have been responded to. Um, any questions of what I, I, I've offered to, to date? Uh, Martin has his hand up again. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I have uh, a few uh, general questions that really appreciate your input on this. Uh, the one is, um, there, 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 are, there are certainly individuals that, who say, well, let's just leave it to law enforcement to put it into model uniform policy. But I'd like to understand your viewpoint of why we need to uh, have this as a standard in statute. Why can't we just uh, rely on uh, there being a uniform model policy that we need to adopt uh, statewide? Okay, uh, you heard from the city councilwoman about her views on that issue. Uh, as many of you know, I've been engaged in this work for quite some time. Um, race data collection is a fine example 
of a, uh, a model policy, even with statutory enactment, the implementation is um, spotty at best. So a model policy is one thing. Um, it needs to be, in order for policies to have effect, you need to train to those policies, but most importantly, you need to hold officers to account on those to those policies. And the policy is an internal uh, procedure within each and every department. So the concerns that Representative Rachelson raised and, and the councilwoman raised, Ms. Hightower, around uniformity certainly apply to your question, Representative. Um, having the force of state law behind a stated objective is vastly, in my opinion, more powerful than uh, a model policy that we've, we've seen this repeatedly in my tenure in doing this work that some departments take to heart and others don't. Um, and of course, in the statutory policies, you still need teeth. And I was encouraged to see, and, and, and thank you for the explanation by ledge council that um, the crime of use of prohibited force is already enacted. I mean, it takes that kind of, those kinds of sanctions for these principles to gain traction. And unfortunately, if people step over that line, uh, prosecutors willing to file charges and convicting police officers of crime is a very challenging um, enterprise. However, if we're going to communicate to officers the need to comply with the policies made by this body, that's what it takes. And if you go to trial and lose, well, at least you've made the effort to um, imprint on other officers that were serious about complying with the policy announced by the people's body, that being the legislature. Kind of ran on and on, but I hope that's responsive to your question. No, no that's, that's, that's very helpful. And I have a, a, a related question, and that is, uh, try, we're trying, there is certainly a, a place for policy. I mean, the policy is where there could be lots of more detail in here uh, than what we have in a, uh, the standards. But I, I'm trying to make sure we're th threading that needle appropriately. And if you have any comments about the level of detail that we have in the standards here, as opposed to what should be left to policy. I don't know if that question is clear enough. I'm just, I just want to make sure we got have this right that we yeah. have the appropriate level of generality, but has the sufficient okay. teeth and leaves the policy where the policy should be. Well, as some of you know, I, I uh, retired from the state at the end of 2012 as director of the Human Rights Commission, and my my ability to follow and uh, my time available to follow the intricacies of your workings is limited. When I was wrapping up my career in state government, there was a relatively new, newly formed body called the LEAB, which I see now has expanded its membership to include the um, racial equity coordinator. I'm not exactly clear as to the interface between the law enforcement advisory board and the legislative body. Um, it may make sense to fashion, I mean, this is bigger than this bill, obviously, and this is a more philosophical question. Um, some, some format like the judicial rules um, that come back for legislative comment, that something that model policies that come out of the LEAB have to be ratified by a committee of both bodies uh, to see if they conform with legislative intent. It's one thought, but it's a big lift and it's late in uh, last year's session. So I think you got to put that in the parking lot. So I guess just to just to make make sure I ask, ask the question right because I appreciate your input on that. But um, do I, let me just ask it this way: Are we putting anything in uh, this uh, bill that you think would be better left in uh, policy developed by the LEAB or others? No, no. I mean, the LEAB, even with an expanded membership is overwhelmingly law enforcement dominated by, by my memory. And thankfully, you're, you 180 of you who we send to Montpelier to develop policy and enact laws is a much more diverse 
broad-based uh, body than the LEAB. So if anything, I would say uh, the more specific you can get in, in your legislative enactments, the better, because generalities tend to lead to dispute as to intent and meaning. I'm a believer in specific language. So I commend the work that you've done on this bill, particularly given the circumstances between COVID and what's happening in the country on police reform. Uh, it's not gonna be the last time you visit this, 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 this issue by a long shot, unfortunately. I mean, this, we're, pushing, uh, we're, we're, we're pushing forward, but we're not near the end. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Barbara. Um, so Robert, one of the questions that I had the other day um, was, and people thought it was too specific. So I'm kind of curious what your take is on it. I'm concerned about um, when law enforcement provokes um, situations that then rise to the occasion where they're justified in using force. And I had asked a witness about if we should define provoking and taunting and include that in the legislation. Um, so I'm just curious about your thoughts. Well, I smiled and laughed because it's a common uh, disciplinary report for inmates it's called agitating and provoking. And uh, officers, correctional officers, write reports on that all the time. And frankly, from my observation and experience, correctional officers often engage in agitating and provoking inmates. Uh, and on occasion, more often than I care to acknowledge, cops do the same thing. I just reread the, uh, the report from the, whatever it was called, the Vermont Mental Health Crisis Response Commission on the Grenin shooting. I assume everybody in the, on the call is familiar with that report. The initial contact was an outrage. Uh, and I'm about to talk to healthcare about this, but it's just the wrong approach to um, attempt to de-escalate somebody in crisis. Right. And, you know, I'm spilling it in my testimony over there, but you show up in a cruiser with siren and blue lights flashing to somebody in crisis, um, wearing body armor and a tool belt with various devices uh, that only exude the notion of control, not connection. If somebody's in the midst of, of, of a mental health crisis, you're not gonna de-escalate that person. They're gonna skyrocket. So I think we really need to rethink our approach to those situations because that's where individuals end up dead. So. I, I hope that was somewhat responsive to your, car, your, your question, Barbara. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Rob. I, I have no further, uh, I'm, I'm happy to respond to further questions now or, or in the future. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with you and uh, see some old friends and colleagues and meet some new folks. Um, welcome to, Montpelier, Chief Pete, look forward to working with you. Thank you so much, sir. I look forward to working with you as well. All right. I'm going to um, leave your meeting then. And uh, again, I appreciate it. I remain available to the committee should additional questions come up. What, out of curiosity, how long do you think you have to work on this? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Uh, we hope the House hopes to pass the budget the end of this week, and I think then things will start to wind down and our time will be more limited. So, so we don't have much time. No, I understood. And I, I, again, I, my heartfelt appreciations to each of you for your commitment in moving these issues forward. It's Great. Well, timely yeah. and necessary. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, good to see you, Rob. Thanks so yeah, much. Likewise. Appreciate it. Bye. Great. Okay. So, um, committee, I'd like to take a break, and then when we come back, um, Chief, you'll be up first. And um, before we take our break, I just do want to now, while I have your attention, welcome you um, and congratulate you on your on your leadership and um, and position in Montpelier. So, just want to say that now. Thank you. Great. And uh, so let's take um, about a uh, ten minute break, and then we'll get back to our testimony. 
Great, thank you. Well, welcome to, uh, to Chief Pete again. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you. Oh. And the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Well, ma'am, first and foremost, thank you so very much. I sincerely, sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I just have a quickly prepared statement. Um, and I'd like to say that honorable members of the legislature, uh, again, good morning. It's still the morning time. Um, my name is Brian Pete, and I thank you for your consideration and the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, please allow me a brief minute to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. I have a bachelor's degree, a science degree in sociology with an emphasis on employment relations and a master's of arts degree in police psychology. I served as a commission officer in the US Air Force as an aircraft maintenance officer and a federal law enforcement officer with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. I also served in Afghanistan in Operation Enduring Freedom. I was a cop in the 11th district on the west side of Chicago, which in 2016 was labeled by the Marshall Project um, as the most dangerous neighborhood and as the most quote unquote violent beat by the Chicago Sun-Times. I temporarily left policing as a senior associate for JP Morgan, working on compliance issues uh, and knowing your client and anti-money laundering. I worked in the Chicago Inspector General's office uh, as a chief investigator and as the chief forensic audit investigator for police accountability, charged with oversight of the Chicago Police Department in preparation for the Department of Justice uh, consent decree after the shooting of Laquan McDonald. I was the chief of police now in Alamogordo, New Mexico, and I now serve um, as the chief of police in Montpelier, and I'm extremely grateful to be here. I have been recognized for my work in mental health and policing and invited by the U.S. Department of Justice, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the University of Cincinnati, PRA Associates, and the International Association of Chiefs of Police to serve on a recent panel that explores current practices, challenges, and best practice resources for successful law enforcement response to those in mental health crisis. I'm a member of the Systemic Diversity and Inclusion Group, the International Associations of Chiefs of Police, and the International Association of Emergency Managers. I also serve on the Vermont League of Cities and Towns Public Safety Policy Committee. Today I'm here representing the Vermont Police Association. I also want to speak to you as someone who's followed in my parents' footsteps in policing, in part to work within a system so to change what's wrong within it. Problems in our profession are symptomatic of issues of our overall governments and social institutional systems. I appreciate everything sincerely that you guys are all doing today because it acknowledges the urgency of the moment that we're facing. Um, and while I'm still familiarizing myself with the players, the policies, the procedures, the laws and the cultures of Vermont, um, I want to make a real specific note. And I mean this, um, that in all my travels and time in law enforcement, Vermont is doing a lot of things right in policing. If they weren't, I'd be the first person to tell you, one of the first people to tell you from the inside out, my goal is to change broken systems. I've been on that other side where those systems didn't work and how that impacted my family and myself. So I will tell you that the police community here is proactive and it's the most receptive and cooperative um, that I've seen as a culture um, in implementing 21st policing uh, policy recommendations as set forth by President Obama. Regarding the uh, House Judiciary's, tra uh, Judiciary's tra draft of uh, S-119, the Vermont Police Association has three primary concerns. Uh, first, we appreciate the House improvement regarding the exception to use the neck restraints, uh, the exception uh, to use of neck restraints and respectfully ask that you consider our suggested edit that striking through language is limiting the exception to situations where no other intervention is available. So in other words, in looking at that side-by-side -side comparison, that to simply state that a law enforcement officer may use prohibit, prohibited neck restraints only in situations where deadly force has been authorized. Um, there are those provisions that I've seen in there that do address what is already being taught, but thank goodness are going to concrete what that understanding should be that law enforcement officers are not justified in continuing the use of prohibited restraints or any type of deadly force when there is no longer an objectively reasonable belief that the suspect continues to pose an immediate threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to any other person. Um, second, uh, we would urge you to strongly consider policy implementations and not statutes because policies are more flexible, they're more adaptable um, than human dynamics and behavior, the challenges that we deal with um, are intricately 
complex. So I think with policies, you're gonna have, we have a better opportunity to change what we see. Um, third, we would uh, invite you to speak with Drew Bloom, who is a use of force expert at the Vermont Police Training Academy, a, a gentleman that I've gotten to meet, know very well and to work with and actually be trained by. Um, and in a lot of places, I've been through FLETSI, I've been through Chicago Police Academy, I've been through state trainings. Um, uh, Drew Bloom, I think, gets it. And, and he, is, he is really um, vested into establishing a culture that is service-based, that's not uh, an us versus them. Um, Drew is a nationally recognized and respected subject matter expert in this field, and I would love to come back and expound upon any of the finer points um, of the standard and those that Drew, Drew can bring to this discussion. For today's purposes, the VPA urges you to also consider the full cost of implementing a new standard. Um, changes in the commonly understood current standard will necessitate a, a pretty big financial investment to training all of our LEOs in the state. Uh, and it will have to be, there will be a revamping of the Vermont uh, Police Training Academy. Um, so there, are, there, there's gonna be a lot of uncertainty about how to implement this standard and how these are gonna be interpreted. And Drew can really tell you um, how this language is going to play out in the courts and how it's going to affect us in the field. I would also urge and push for community conversations for realistic and constructive dialogue with all vested stakeholders. When I came to Montpelier, I sought out audiences with those who can otherwise be considered as advocates that support defunding or abolishing of police. I opened the doors for those who advocated for eight can't wait and for the ACLU's 10-part uh, plan. Not many, unfortunately, took me up on the offer, but there were some who did. And we made tremendous strides in um, mutual understanding with, with this developed moniker that we're gonna dream bigger and we're gonna do better. And um, so my goal and the goal of the VPA is to challenge constructs to improve them and not to tear them down. We at the VPA and other state law enforcement leaders, especially including myself, um, want to stop talking about other community groups. We wanna start talking with them. Um, I, you won't hear me say bad things about anyone who is a perceived um, enemy of law enforcement or has different ideals or anything. I wanna to talk to everybody because that's how I'm gonna learn. Um, so the lives of people in our community and the lives of our officers are dependent upon how we interact with one another. If we don't all get in the same room to identify these issues, understand the positions of one another and challenge our long, long standing assumptions about the other's opinion, we will squander the opportunity to heal and move forward together. There will be unintended consequences that will bring us right back into the same situation. So we all have to encourage healing as we institute change within our profession. As such, I and the VPA also support the governor's executive order because its recommendations challenge traditional ways of us doing business while acknowledging the law and the wisdom that works. Um, it pushes us to collaborate. So with that, um, Madam, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak with all of you all and I stand ready for any questions that any of you may have of me. Great, thank you so much. I very much appreciate your testimony and your service as well to, uh, to our country and communities. And uh, Vermont is very fortunate to, to have you in your leadership role, so, so thank you. I do see two hands for now, uh, Martin and Nader, and then Selena. Okay, so why don't we go in that order? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chief Pete, uh, and welcome again to, to Vermont. We're delighted that, to have you down the road uh, from us in Montpelier, in virtual Montpelier, although I'm sitting in South Burlington right now. Um, so I, just a, a few questions and comments that you, I may want you to comment on. One is I want to make sure that you uh, have looked at the most recent version because it sounded like you may have been looking at a different version with respect to the prohibited restraints uh, because if you're looking at the side-by-side -side, uh, comparison, that has changed a little bit. And, and you don't have to look at it now, but I want to make sure that you know, take a look at what we have on the on the web today, and then you can provide further comments because uh, it, it there still is it's very clear. I think we put language in that allows uh, uh, self defense uh, defense uh, for law enforcement if they use a chokehold. Although we're trying to make very clear uh, uh, the prohibition as much as possible. But in any event, moving moving on, I guess the the question. Uh, so I understand, I understand where folks are coming from to some extent on this, hey, let's just leave it to policy. You know, we've certainly heard some uh, reasons why 
uh, we shouldn't. Uh, I would include the fact that policies, yes, they're presumably more flexible, but they're not actually uh, enforceable. Um, and, and so there's perhaps a somewhat less incentive uh, to always follow the policies. And we do have examples where policies are there and they simply are not followed. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is make sure, you know, I think there's certainly, like I say, room for policy as well. And that's to get into the details uh, that, you know, the, to flesh out essentially the standards that we are putting forth uh, in statute. And, and I, will, I will note that there are 40 states in, in the country that do have uh, standards uh, in statute, although probably most of them are really not sufficient uh, because they are uh, dated. Uh, just, like, just like ours is also dated because our only policy in there is this justifiable homicide, which uh, is, is probably even unconstitutional, but any event, so, so, I mean, I look at, for instance, just South Burlington's policy and it, yeah, it goes into uh, some depth as far as what are non-lethal uses, what are the different kinds of uh, force that can be used. And I could see that fitting into the overall standards that we, we have. Uh, and, and I guess the question, and let me just, one, one other point I just wanna make real quickly uh, and that is with regards to the policy and whether it's in, enforceable. And the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council manual for training use of force, uh, what the law enforcement looks at when they're training for use of force states that generally speaking, a violation of department policy can result in sanctions or punishments from your department. Uh, and if the clause uh, of the policy that is violated mirrors the law, it can also result in criminal charges or lawsuits. Uh, the bottom line being that really policies are not enforceable in court. You need to have laws to do that. But I'm gonna get to a question. I apologize, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, just going on and on about this, but I wanna understand what more specifically uh, the issues are with the standards that we're putting in. And, and I, and, if the standard I think has been relatively well established for a while, uh, that use of force needs to be objectively reasonable. I think that's pretty well established in, in uh, law, uh, that it has to be necessary. There are numerous cases that say it has to be necessary. There's some that don't really focus on that uh, and proportional. And, and I think that's what we're trying to get at is this overarching that that use of force has to be those things. And the next step in use of deadly force, you have to have uh, imminent threat to, to death or serious bodily injury. And, and I'm not understanding why those standards would be changing that you need that flexibility in policy. I, I think we're giving plenty of room for the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council or the LEAB or whoever to develop that policy around these more general standards that we would be putting into legislation. So that was a lot, but I wonder if you want to comment on, on some of those points that I was trying to make. Well, yes, sir. Uh, again, I, I, I think I understand where you're, where, you, where you're definitely coming from. The way I see it is that, um, again, with, with, with the flexibility of policy, um, Policy to me uh, would be an affirmative defense, if you will. I, that, that's how I see it. Um, but an affirmative defense is something that it still pushes you into court. I don't, I, for most or less, I, for the most part of it, some of the specific languages when we start talking about absolutes, when we start talking about if this, then that, then, then there's going to create unintended consequences or hesitations within the field. Um, and Drew can, can speak to how, how some of the specific language is going to affect two training. Overall, no one has, uh, that I'm aware of, uh, any pushback to, to again, de-escalation, to, to exhausting. That's what, as you had mentioned, that's what we've been trained to do. And that's what a lot of agencies trained to do is you don't, you don't result, you don't come in at level 10, you come in at the same level commiserate to de-escalate the, um, uh, the current situation. So I, I just think that in terms of that, the specific sticking point that 
uh, of this that gives me the most concern is to just say that a prohibitive restraint, a, a, a chokehold, a neck restraint, anything to that effect, if it's still deadly force, it's still deadly force. It's, it's an affirmative defense, but to me, it's no different than saying if, if, if I'm justified at running somebody over, hitting somebody with a car, if they're shooting at someone else, then th there's deadly force is still deadly force. And, and what we have to look at doing is it's going to create a hesitation that if I'm fighting for my life, which several times I have been doing, um, that I want to make sure I have every op op opportunity to me available to save myself, to save someone else. And that if I can, if, if, if I'm using uh, a deadly force, uh, if I'm using some type of a hold like that, then I can stop that if, if that's the only means I have. But I, but having this specific language, while it does create an affirmative defense, it, it creates the opportunity to say it's still against the law. And in, in with that same acknowledgement, the challenge is that, hey, if, if that's already in the policy, but then if that is, then I also want to acknowledge that if it's still there, if it's still recognized that I think that by striking some of that language will give the, still, the, the same outcome. Everybody recognizes that there is a need or their situations may, may come up in which uh, somebody might find themselves having to use this um, in, in making it ambiguous is going to make it dangerous, I think. So, so yeah, that, if I could just follow up. So, yeah, that's certainly on the prohibited restraint and we are trying to work that language out, but, but I, I, I will, let me ask just a more specific question. So we do have in the standard in this draft, um, essentially a, a requirement of uh, de-escalation. It's not called that, but it's in subsection uh, B7A, and it talks about prior to using force that a law enforcement officer shall, if feasible, uh, take proactive actions to stabilize the situation, and it lists some various things that are, I think, fairly common as far as uh, de-escalation techniques. The question I have is, why, why shouldn't we put something like that into a statute, into a standard, to make very clear that as representatives of Vermonters, that we expect all law enforcement throughout the state uh, to use those kind of techniques when they are feasible, because it's within, you know, there's a lot of deference there. When I say when feasible, that gives the law enforcement uh, lots of room to spell this out in policy and in training, et cetera. But why can't we expect uh, and, and that's really, I see this bill as an expectation of uh, the Vermonters across the state on what we're expecting of law enforcement who we have authorized to use force. I'm, I'm not understanding why, what's the problem with us being able to have that expectation in, in statute? Well, yes, sir, that one specifically, I didn't, my, my focus was on particularly um, the neck restraints, but in that, what I'm looking at and the concept of the, in the entirety is, is that something else is going to happen that's going to dictate an argument or discussion over what is feasible. And that, that's why I think that flexibility of having of, 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 of the, some of these, these items ingrained in policy rather than specifically all, always outlined in statute, then I think that there, there brings in that flexibility for the legislature to come back and say, this is how we're defining feasible. Well, I think, and, and this is a situation, I just see that the standards and legislation works along with policy. And in that one particular instance, uh, I would hope that, that the LEAB or whoever's developing the policy uh, looks at the issue of feasibility. We are giving still law enforcement a lot of deference to work out those details. But the general concept that you know, de-escalate when feasible, uh, we want law enforcement to follow that. But we're leaving it to law enforcement to flesh out the details and in the training. So that's what I'm trying to get at. But yes, sir, and I understand it. But I think that I think that the danger comes in the specific the specificity of the wording, and that causes that ambiguity causes reluctance or hesitation in critical moments. And, or, or, or not fully understanding, well, what, what does le legislation mean by this? How do we train? We need further guidance. We need further information on it. And I think that with having a policy, can, we can coordinate those things. We can work out those nuances to add those into what is meant and, and what, um, 
what what the what's coming down. Yeah, I guess I don't see that much disagreement so, between so us on that, but uh, but any of it, yes, I'll I'll cede to, to to Nader and others. Yeah, yeah, this is really time for um, asking questions of the witness to make sure that we that we understand what what the witnesses are are saying. Um, Nader, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chief. I'm I'm glad that you're here in Vermont, and thank you for uh, testifying. I appreciate it. My question is. Uh, think much less complicated than Martin's, but I'm just curious if you can talk more uh, about cost that you brought up. That was one of the concerns. Um, and I'm wondering if this, if if passed and implemented, if this would look like some sort of um, you know, e-learning that would go out and how much money that would cost or would officers have to go back to the academy for a couple of days of training or if this would extend the length of the academy. If you could talk a bit more about cost and your concerns there. I think it would, yes, sir. And first and foremost, thank you again. Um, I think it would be a combination of all the above uh, and looking, it, it would be a ripple effect of, of looking, there has to be different training on it. Um, so so th there could be some portions that could require e-learning. There are going to definitely be requirements for people who are use of force instructors in different departments to have to probably go back to the academy to get specific guidance on it for the academy to develop specific gu uh, guidance um, and how they're going to do things. Um, then you're looking at overtime coverages. You're looking at uh, how am I going to be able to get people out to training? How am I going to be able to bring people into training? And especially in an area of, of with, with COVID right now, um, there are going to be significant financial restraints in doing that. Anytime that, that, that new legislation like this is going to be enacted to make sure that we're going to be uh, in accordance with it and meet the spirit of what it is. Um, that, that there is going to be, there are going to be uh, costs associated with it. And, and I don't, I, and the, my feeling in, in discussing all these with my peers is that there is not, um, there is not a disagreement to, to working on, on these. Uh, we just want to make sure that we do it in a smart way and that we do it in a way that's not going to create room for ambiguity. And that's why I would highly uh, recommend and encourage that, uh, that Drew Bloom, who can probably speak better to the specifics of this, um, with use of force better than I could, um, that you give him the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Selena. Sorry, I think I was muted. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I want to echo other people's thanks for your testimony and your work. And um, I, my one of my questions, I think, really Martin posed about sort of m just more details about your concerns about the difference between policy and statutory guidance. Um, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that a previous witness, and I believe you were with us then, said um, about the the difference was that the ability to create um, more consistency across the state. And I don't know if you want to speak to that question at all or not. But I also, um, you referenced at one point in your testimony some proposed language from um, the police association. I don't believe I've seen that. I looked back through our committee page and couldn't find it posted. So I'm wondering if that could just be shared more broadly with the committee. Um, so that's just a request. And then if there, if you do wanna talk more about the issue of just the question of um, the consistency that uh, statutory guidance would provide across the state and that question of how to the real the real variance right now and how police departments are um, working through these issues on the local level and and the kind of um, strain that that does then at times create between local government police departments and um, residents and citizens of a municipality or jurisdiction Yes, ma'am. Um, 
again, thank you very much. I, I could send out some of the information and some of the conversations that uh, we've been having uh, that I, I've had with, with Drew Bloom um, specifically and then some within the VPA. There are, um, there's just like different levels of wording that we could send send out to you. And again, uh, this is something that Drew Bloom could, um, could really expound upon. Uh, with, with regards to the consistency across the state, I, it's from what I've seen here that Vermont has some significant challenges, especially with all the rural areas and the, the lack of resources that governments as well as agencies have in, in bringing training or bringing technology or any of the pillars that are discussed, the six pillars discussed in 21st century policing. I, I think, again, from, from that standpoint, um, laws have always been created and laws should be created for accountability and transparency. Uh, well, I'm sorry, laws have always been created just to make sure that we don't violate people's rights. Um, so I, I definitely understand that, but uh, what, what policies, again, to me policies, there, there is that specific, there is that flexibility and that specific, specific expectation that these policies are gonna be followed. But in, in what, what that flexibility is, Policies can also allow for being elaborate, you know, elaboration on what what mandates are going to come in and how do we meet those mandates. Uh, that that's why I'm more or less advocating. To me, the policies are it's it's the same thing with more flexibility, the same level of expectation, and the same level of um, of, of of guidance for law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Yeah. Great, Tom and then Ken. Great, thank you. Chief, uh, welcome to Vermont. Uh, thank you, um, sir. Was the culture shock that wasn't too bad or or maybe it was? <laughs> no, no, sir, respectfully, I like the Yankee spirit. It was defined to me as we don't, we, 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 uh, we hold you accountable and I really like that, it's groovy. Yeah, great, great. So uh, Drew Bloom, what's, what's his capacity now? Uh, he is the um, well. He's one of the directors at the at the academy, the state academy, and okay. and he is pretty much in my mind uh, probably all things guru on use of force. Uh, he's been doing it for thirty years, and oh. he's helped to, de to help to define uh, define policies, procedures, best practices, state practices, and and what we adopt and how we um, uh, utilize use of force. Right. Yeah. He may have been in committee at some other time. I, I don't recall it, but. Uh, um, I certainly hope we do. I, I'm going to assume that we're going to reach out to him and, and have him come in and, um, it, you know, and tell us about um, about Forrest. But um, so uh, I wrote down a couple of questions here. If we put de-escalation into statute, aren't we legislating what is already being done? And uh, I, I guess how extensive is a de-escalation training? Uh, you, you may not be as familiar with uh, with Vermont as uh, as um, you know out in Chicago or Illinois, but um, yeah, if you could just talk about that, I guess. I'm sorry, sir. So, so pretty much what 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 de-escalation in the statute? Yeah, I mean, if we put it in training or if we put it in uh, statute. Aren't we just legislating what's already being done, which I would assume is already being done? I, I think it it is all it's, it's all it's already being done with with the exception again of that flexibility. Um, so, so like in a court case, if a court's going to define what what that level of reasonableness is, then with a statute, it's you know it, it just has to me it, you have to be careful and the language that you put into if it's like definitive language. Then it's going to be harder to try to change that statute than it is for for policy, which is why I would again uh, with Drew recommend that he would that he could speak to some of those uh, some of the issues that are in there uh, that uh, and some of the nuances of language. So in, in statute, then it could be potentially uh, um, what I want to say uh, uh, could work against the way uh, that you people are trained to de-escalate. Yes, sir. It, again, it depends on the ruling. It depends on what, what a court may come into. And, and with regards to use of force, um, I, I, part of my certification in coming here, I had to do a use of force training uh, at the academy. And um, it, was, it was actually even better than what I learned in Fletzy because 
what accompanied with the use of force was a sense of culture. And to me, culture is what is what is going to change an institution and is what is needed in our, our in our institution to change it. And so so it, this is a not only this is what you do, but this is a why you do it. So that why component that that bit of adult learning, I think is what brought it in. So in Vermont, we don't expect you to do what Chicago does. We don't expect you to do what everybody else does. We expect you to do what Vermont does, because these are the expectations of Vermont tiers. So so I, I think that's what one of the big pieces of glue that really struck me and, and how things were being done here. Um, and early in your testimony, I, I, and if I'm putting words in your mouth, just, just stop me, but um, you met, I think you mentioned being in several physical uh, situations in West Chicago. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, I, did, I got that right. <laughs> so with this, this language that we're proposing on use of force, how could it have uh, been detrimental in those situations? And, and I guess what potential uh, could it have had in putting you in even more, or not necessarily you, but any officer in more danger? Uh, again, I, I um, so specifically, I just wanna, wanna kind of make it clear that a lot of things that the spirit of what I think the legislation is trying to do, we agree with the spirit. We just want to make sure that the wording is, and the flexibility is going to be there to change it. But with, with regards to personal experiences, um, um, in, in those situations that if, if I'm in a fight hands-on for my life, because sometimes it just doesn't come and you get sucker punched, you go to the ground, somebody's on the ground, they're pulling for your gun, everything else that's happening in those specific situations, um, if I'm trained, if I'm taught, if, if I'm always hearing that I can't, you can't do a chokehold or anything. You know, I used to be a grappler. I used to wrestle in high school and a little bit in college that if I can't even that moment of hesitation, um, of trying to gain control of somebody, uh, could and would have cost my life in several situations. Um, I think that the, the biggest thing on there is just to make sure what, 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 what is in here, especially the emphasis on duty to intervene and the de-escalation part that once the force is, is applied and once it's no longer necessary, you it comes down. And, and I think that is the, the, the crucial part in that training and that understanding. Thank you. Um, I, I guess this isn't necessarily for you, but for uh, maybe even for Martin, um, so if I remember right, some of this language is partially uh, um, uh, mirroring Seattle's uh, policy. Question for me? Yeah, for, for anybody, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, probably. For it, yeah, it does. it's from several places. It's from lots of uh, case law that's already out there and looking at some uh, uh, policies in the state, in Vermont, as well as Seattle, as well. Right. Some of the language is okay. from Seattle. Okay, great. Thank you. And, uh, and just what I wanted to touch on with that is um, Seattle is, and I don't know if it's Seattle or if it's Washington at this point, but um, I'm pretty sure it's Seattle, um, is this is all policy in Seattle. And, and the reason that a lot of this was put into effect in Seattle the, the policies that they have to go by is from uh, uh, the, the policing, uh, um, I, I guess you'd call mandates from back in the Ob Obama administration. And, and Seattle was forced into doing a lot of this because they were in disarray. It, it, their, their police department out there was, uh, um, was a mess, as are some other police departments that have been uh, mandated by the federal government to to follow certain guidelines and and to 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 me to force the state of vermont by putting this stuff into statute is is, is forcing a situation that's not happening in vermont uh, vermont uh, the policing in vermont is not like seattle was or uh you know or uh, like some uh, you know i'm sure other departments that that need help and, um, and I just don't think it's a good idea to put this into statute, uh, you know, flexibility, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a big um, 
a big issue. And, um, you know, we, we heard from an attorney earlier that, you know, uh, if this, if, if we go into statute, I mean, it's just, it's gonna, I found it kind of interesting that he was even testifying, but um, uh, it's just gonna boost his work. It's, it's gonna give him more work, you know, and, and more money to make. And, and I just thought it was kind of strange that he was even here, but um, uh, so I guess that's, that's my opinion or my voice is, is uh, I, I don't think most of this should be put into a uh, uh, statute. Maybe some of it can, but um, but this, uh, the use of force, I, I think, um, like, like the chief said, um, if he didn't have those options, um, you know, he would probably be dead. And, and, and again, I wasn't going to bring up my son in this, you know, being a, a police officer, but when the chief brought up that he used to be a grappler, you know, and, and my son used to be a grappler and, um, and, and I, I hope he uses whatever, whatever tools, um, you know, are at his disposal in, in those situations. And I, and I already know that he has, but, and, and I would hate to see my son or anyone's son or anyone's chief of police uh, be put into first just to be in those situations and but then to be in those situations uh, and uh, and it's a good a good metaphor a good pun to, but to be in a, a fight with your hands tied. Uh, Ken. Uh, welcome, Chief. Um, welcome to Vermont. Welcome to Montpelier. I'm a, I'm a couple towns south of you in Northfield. Um, I just want to say um, I really appreciate your uh, perspective and enthusiasm and open to learn, uh, which we all are. Um, and just one, uh, coming from past 10 years on the select board here in Northfield, I just, I, I, I just would like clarity or, or your opinion. I think in your brief time here in Vermont, we're all going to police differently in the areas that we represent uh, because of population or the, the, the makeup of the community is much different. Like I have North University that I'm looking at right now and you know, uh, Burlington is going to have different with UVM and all that stuff. Um, I, I mean, am I on the right track with that thinking? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You as well, sir. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Make sure there aren't any other questions. Um, I don't see any. And um, I've asked our um, committee assistant, Lori, to reach out to um, to Drew Bloom. I think it would be very helpful. And I very much appreciate your recommendation. Um, so we'll see if we can get him get him in here. And, um, and thank you again. Um, really appreciated your testimony. This is an ongoing conversation. So I look forward to, um, to speaking with you again. Great. Thank you, ma'am. And respectfully, thank you all for your work that you're doing for our community, our constituents. Great. Thank you. Great, right, take care. Yes, okay, so um, committee, we're gonna hear from, move to Lori, and then um, after that, uh, we're gonna have to uh, stop on 119 so we can take our quick uh, vote on the, um, the SR 22 bill so we can uh, let the speaker know our, and, uh, and thanks to uh, Falco who will be, who is available tomorrow. So I wasn't sure how far we'd get today. Um, so welcome, Lori. And again, Lori, um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to give you only about 10 minutes. But if that's not enough, um, I don't know if you are available tomorrow. But certainly, okay. um, we want to make sure we hear everything that you have to say at some point. Sure, sure. And, and if you have other questions, too, I can come back. Can you hear me OK? Yes, yes. Thank oh, you. Great. Yes. Um, so NAMI Vermont is the state chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Vermont. And we're comprised of people who have a mental illness, their family members, and other advocates. And uh, we really appreciate the committee's work on this particular bill uh, to, to be able to repeal the statute and uh, put some guidelines around the use of force. And our comments are going to really focus on uh, mental health and interactions with law enforcement. Um, this bill is of, of great importance to NAMI Vermont and our community of individuals and families living with a mental health condition 
many families and friends do not want to call law enforcement when a mental health crisis occurs. And just the presence of law enforcement can escalate a situation, resulting in our loved ones being either traumatized, uh, charged with a criminal offense, or worse, use of deadly force, when all that was really needed was to help keep them safe because of their possible suicide attempts or suicide ideation. We really need to seek alternative, collaborative approaches to prevent and respond to crises. And we need to decriminalize our responses to mental health crises. However, if there is an encounter with law enforcement, we want to ensure that law enforcement does have the right training to be able to help de-escalate a situation, and really de-escalation is that number one priority. You know, we also need to invest in better recruitment and training of all officers. Building those collaborative community partnerships and intensive training will help improve responses and resources for individuals and families that have a mental health crisis. And NAMI Vermont is doing a lot of this work right now, and I just wanted to inform you of some of the work that, that we are doing. Um, we have trainings that help build empathy and reduce stigma through our lived experience with our NAMI in our own voice presentation. And we've done this for all new recruits, police departments, sheriff departments, and state police. And what it consists of is two people in recovery share their lived experience about what it means to live with mental illness. And we can customize these presentations for people to help them better understand what works for them whenever an encounter may happen. And trainings need to include lived experience stories with family members as well and who have been involved with law enforcement interactions with their loved ones. And we have worked with the Vermont Police Academy and Team 2 to provide uh, presentations like this and we've gotten great feedback. Um, that they had learned from other people's lived experience and they can respond differently because of hearing from other people and, and what has worked for them. Um, NAMI Vermont has uh, NAMI signature programs and these are developed nationally and they're used nationwide. So the, the other programs that we have um, is an evidence-based program called Family to Family and really gives family members uh, the better tools to communicate and support their loved one's recovery. And you know, we would really recommend training for law enforcement as well as correctional officers so that they do, know, they do understand how to communicate better with people who may have a mental health condition and build that empathy and compassion. So we, we really feel that that's a, a very important step in the right direction with providing the right training. Um, there, were, there were just a few comments that I, I wanted to make um, on the language and um, really appreciate the amendment. So I, I, I had to go back and, and look at um, what I first wrote because you, you definitely improved on it from feedback um, from other testimony. And, um, you know, we, we appreciate on uh, page two where you change the language um, where, where it says under B, um, 6B, so changing it to whether the subject is physically or mentally impaired in a manner that interferes with the subject's ability to understand or comply with law enforcement commands. Um, this is a good change. I think the other language is very archaic and stigmatizing. Um, so we appreciate that change. And also, you know, I've heard comments about looking at um, policies. And at the bottom of page three, uh, the very last sentence, where uh, there's reference to use of force and being consistent with law and with agency policies, um, it will be very important that you include a good uh, representation or diversity of representation of stakeholders to help review policies and have a standard, standardized policies that the, the state can follow. 
and to include uh, advocacy organizations like NAMI Vermont and other organizations who do have the lived experience. Um, going to the next page, I, I, I had a question for the committee about um, page four at the top and um, where it says whether the decision by a law enforcement officer to use force was objective, objectively reasonable shall be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation. I, I guess I just wanted clarification as to what that means. Is this after action review evaluation to determine there was um, something that needs to be addressed? Uh, I'm going to ask Bryn if she's available and if she heard the question. I only heard half of the question. Could you repeat the first part? Sure. At uh, the top of page four, number four, um, there, there's a statement about um, the use of force was objectively reasonable, shall be evaluated from the perspective of a reasonable officer in the same situation. What exactly does that mean? So um, that is an example of a portion of the bill that is really um, codifying what the Supreme Court has ruled um, in these types of use of force cases. So um, I can direct you to uh, a memo that I drafted for another committee that um, talks about that jurisprudence, if you'd like. Yeah, I just wasn't sure who was doing the evaluation and then what happens after that evaluation. Um, so that was, that was just a little unclear. Right, so, so the court would be making this type of evaluation. Um, in the context of a civil of a civil lawsuit against law enforcement. Okay. Um, also, you know, I really wanted to stress at the bottom of the page where under seven A, that where you discuss um, de-escalation, and I really want that point emphasized in this bill, that that should really be the primary objective is de-escalation before any force, uh, use of force would even be considered. Um, so having emphasis more on de-escalation is very important and not so much how to do the training for de-escalation, but the importance of implementing that first tactic. Um, you know, as I look at moving on to page five, um, you added a whole new section there. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit about the, the language. And it would seem that, you know, law enforcement is going to need some extensive training on all of these areas to really determine whether a subject may be um, um, or a subject's conduct may be the result of a medical condition, mental health condition, et cetera. Um, would maybe a change in language that they should consider these factors because they are not really subject matter experts on these areas, but they definitely should be trained um, to consider these, these factors um, when they are in a situation. Um, the other comment I had is on page six, um, going down the page under uh, B3, a law enforcement officer shall cease the use of deadly force as soon as the subject surrenders. Um, you know, I'm looking at this as a mental health crisis, and hopefully once the person is complying, that any use of force will be they will cease any use of force there. Um, and of course, I am looking at this from that mental health perspective. Uh, so the word uh, cease the use of deadly force, um, you know, also consider any use of force. Um, number four, 
looking at um, how an officer is to identify themselves and warn that deadly force may be used. Um, this can be very escalating to somebody who is in a mental health crisis that if you're warning them you're going to use force, that they're going to be in a fight-flight situation where they're going to defend themselves um, because they're afraid they're going to be hurt. And, you know, maybe using other tactics um, and communication methods before, uh, you know, threatening deadly force. I think if a last resort, yes, they, they should identify that they will use force. Um, but also, too, when people are in a mental health crisis, it's very hard for them to understand commands and um, any conversation because they are in that heightened state of dysregulation. Um, going to the next page, on page seven, number six, you made an amendment there with a law enforcement officer shall not use a prohibited restraint on a person for any reason. Um, I, this is a good change. I, I was going to comment on the previous language for this, that uh, the language previously almost really negated the, um, the prohibited restraint clause. And um, I think that this is a good change along with the other factors that you've outlined for guidelines for officers. Um, that's, that's our comments. Do you great. Have any Thank questions? You. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate this help. Um, okay, Martin, I see you have a question and folks, I realize it's just about 1230. So we'll, we will be running a little bit over. Uh, go ahead, Martin. Should be a quick question. I'm just wondering uh, how much uh, you track uh, instances where law enforcement has uh, had to deal with individuals who may be suffering from a mental crisis or may have mental uh, health issues? Um, so people who may contact us and disclose to us that a situation had happened or? Well, I guess let me ask a little bit different. I mean, do, do you, do you have a, know the number of deaths that have occurred in police encounters where the victim was suffering from a mental uh, health condition, mental illness condition? Um, you know, I, I, in the Mental Health uh, Crisis Commission report, you know, there, there was some information there about that. Um, you know, as far as NAMI Vermont goes, we, we've had um, members who have had um, situations where uh, they were either tasered, they were shot, um, they did not want to come to this committee and give testimony, um, more in, in fear of uh, still living in that community with their loved ones. But um, I think it, it's very difficult when somebody is in a mental health crisis and you know, the only reason why uh, family members may call police is because of safety, and they respond. Um, you know, we recommend people to call the crisis line. We recommend people use the text line, the Vermont support line. They even call uh, NAMI Vermont support group facilitators. You know, we help to provide support to other family members to, um, to help uh, figure out different ways of approaching things instead of calling the police. And, you know, if families are able to help de-escalate the situation at home, you know, we're able to give them the education and training through NAMI Vermont, the Family to Family course, to help with that. So they are helping their family member in this recovery process. And it really is about communication and being able to connect with people to be able to help de-escalate a situation. Um, mostly any law enforcement interaction is going to escalate unless a, an officer has proper training to handle it in a way that builds rapport and de-escalates a situation. 
Um, you know, there, there is a documentary called Ernie and Joe, Crisis Cops, and um, we would like to show that to the legislators and other interested community members that, you know, I think you could learn a lot from the documentary and we'll, would be happy to help set that up. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. And, and my, my question uh, isn't really around the testimony you just made, but I, I do know that uh, a few years ago that uh, we had, we did uh, do some legislation around uh, the way that uh, policing was done with people in, you know, in special situations like you've been talking about. And, and I don't recall exactly what the laws were that we passed or exactly what we did. And I'm, I'm hoping that you do. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and maybe you could uh, uh, talk just a little bit about uh, how that has helped change things. Um, so I, I, I guess I want to refer to which you know, which legislation you were referring to. I, uh, I, I don't remember details on it. I just remember that we had done some work. Uh, that or Dan suicide Donahue prevention? Was, pardon me? Was it with the gun legislation and the suicide prevention? I know that there was one uh, legislation that, that we had supported a waiting period for. Um, I, I think it was probably guns. around the suicide prevention. And it seems like it was something to, uh, that had to do with interaction with, um, um, with, with police departments. Hmm. I'm trying to recall. I'm not sure if I do remember. Right. The last couple of years. That, that's fine. That's fine. I, yeah. uh, I didn't mean to get you off, off track <laughs> on, on what we were talking about, but um, thank you. You know, one other point that I do want to make with this 988 federal legislation that they, they have passed, um, I think this is a great step in the right direction with, you know, it's not only a suicide prevention lifeline number, but this could also be that mental health crisis number, the go-to number, that if you need to call mobile crisis or... Um, need other resources that will be able to help people as opposed to calling 911 and getting law enforcement involved. So, you know, it's really looking at decriminalizing mental health crises, figuring out different approaches to respond. Great. Thank you. Um, Selena, last question is yours. Um, Thank you, and thank you for your testimony and your work. And I wondered if you wanted to weigh in at all on this question of, um, you know, whether to sort of let law enforcement be governed by policy that's not codified in statute here, which seems to me actually is, is kind of our current practice to some degree, or whether you think um, having these finer points embodied in statute is is going to be useful for um, the people that you work with. Um, the way your bill is written, I, I really like the improvements that you've added to it. Um, you know, I, I, I believe there's a gap with including the voices of people with lived experience or the community um, in governance oversight with this. And, uh, you know, some of our testimony to with the other bills um, with, with the Vermont Criminal Justice Council was really looking at that balance. You know, instead of having police provide their own oversight I think if we are passing policy, we need the voices of the people that are most affected at the table as part of the decision-making process. Um, with everybody at the table, I think you're going to get more buy-in from the community and people are, are going to be more accepting because they're part of the process as opposed to um, not being part of it. I, I agree with you really wholeheartedly and thank you for making that point, which I think we've heard 
a number of times and I'm hoping as legislators that um, at least in our role where we are becoming more responsive and, and better at building inclusive um, processes as we develop policy. Um, but I think my question is um, from an earlier witness, um, Chief Pete, we heard that it would be better I think, I mean, I don't want to put words into that witness's mouth, but what I heard was that it would be better to give law enforcement a, more, uh, a little more flexibility and discretion, and that the way to do that would be to create policy, but not, but not binding statutory guidance or standards. Um, mm. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, personally, you know, I, I'm all about having systems and processes in place and having that structure gives guidelines for people to know what you can and you cannot do. Um, and that way there, you always go back to, uh, the statute to hold accountability. And I think that's what the community is wanting. We want accountability. And whether it is putting it in statute or working with the community very closely to ensure their input is considered um, and part of the process, that's what we need to do. Um, it, it needs to be inclusive. And if we have to put up those parameters and put it in statute, then that's what we need to do. Um, you know, and, and hold accountability for people's actions and performance. Thank you. That's really helpful. I appreciate that. Great, great. Well, thank you, Lori. Thank you so much. Mm, and, thank um, you. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so folks, thank you for staying late. I just want to uh, get a vote on um, H five seven eight, which is our. It's what I sent around yesterday. It's um, the Senate has sent it back. Um, that's the SR twenty two bill. Um, Senate. Very few changes. Pretty much, they they change the dates as we're doing in many of our bills, given where we are, um, and then also took out some language that had been passed in the miscellaneous motor vehicles bill. So, I'm hoping that folks had a chance to take a look at what I what I sent. Um, I've heard from some of you, um, but I would like to um, recommend that we concur. But I just want to uh, just folks, if you could let me know what, what you're what you're thinking, uh, or we could do a show of show of hands. Um, I've heard from Kelly, Ken, Will, Leave, Martin, and myself. So just jump right in. Yeah, Barbara. Yeah, I'm good with it. Okay, Barbara, you are I'm good too. with it as well. I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm good with it as well. Okay, great. Patrick and Coach, you good? I think Coach might be in the other. I think Coach might be talking to somebody else. Okay, great. And so, so that's helpful. And Will, you were the reporter, so the speaker would look to you to um, to say that we recommend concurrence and what the what the minor changes. Are you are you good with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Okay, great. All right, wonderful. So, so when on do the you floor, think it would that, come it, before the full house? Excuse me. Um, yes. Yeah. When do we oh. think it would come before the full house? Oh, so I don't. She might want to. She might want to do that today, because um, we it's it's back in a. I, actually, I'm assuming that we actually have it in our committee, but she might want to do that today just to get it. You know, All right. let, makes sense. Let, let the Senate know. I'm not sure. I'll let her know, but it's just a quick. You know, we concur basically because there really, really weren't any changes. Um, right. So, okay. Um, so, Coach, are you good with the changes to the um, SR22 bill that the Senate did? You didn't get your vote. Uh, yes, yes. Great. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry about that. No, no worries. Um, Tom. Yeah, by concurring uh, um, and, and no changes, this it's not debatable on the floor, right? Mm. Uh, Selena. It's debatable, it's not amendable. Oh, it is debatable. Yeah. So, so our so our is debatable. I think. Okay. So our, yeah, our that choices here. 
yeah, our choices here would um, would be concur or concur with um, with amendment instant yeah, further instance amendment, of amendment yeah. right. And so what I'm recommending and what I'm hearing from everybody is concur as is it's right. it's good. I'm not hearing anybody say, well, you know, we don't really like these dates. You know, the invasion doesn't need as much time. You know, that, that would be the type of thing. Well, yeah, and I think it is amendable, right? I was wrong about that. I just like had a brain freeze where I was thinking this was uh, coming out of a conference or something, which of course it's not. So it probably is amendable. Oh, yeah. That would be the difference. So is that clear? So so again, oh. our choice is because, um, yeah, because this is the first time it's coming back from, okay. from, from the Senate. I think I was thinking of uh, coming out of conference committee. Right. Yeah. No. This is this is the first time it's coming back. So. Um, I think so you're trying to lure me into a false sense of complacency. <laughs> so, so to be clear, this is amendable or it isn't. No, it it is. We could we could do a further instance of amendment if there was something that, um, you know, that we didn't agree with what they did. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's, it's normal everyday, normal everyday bill that goes to the floor, correct? Yep. Yeah. I think so. It's treated okay. that way. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So are folks still good with what we did with concurring? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Isn't it Great. nice when we're one big happy family? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I know you, you just want to hug. <laughs> oh, I missed you. <laughs> Hugging is out until at least 2021. Right. Okay. And then, um, and then we can um, talk about it more tomorrow or, or um, be in touch. But again, the, um, I think Eric and Michelle did an excellent job on the um, section by section. Um, for S-234, and I've gone through it in terms of um, what sections Kelly um, will do and the um, sections Tom and, and uh, Martin, so I can, I'll type that up and, and send that to everybody. But um, Kelly, thank you so much for, for taking the lead. And yeah. uh, as I said to Kelly, I said, I think I'm getting sentimental about our, our happy family, our days are... <laughs> are coming to a, an end um, in terms of this Judiciary Committee. So Kelly, I really do appreciate you you stepping up and, and taking the lead here. And um, I, you know, in this particular bill, when you look through it, we really have not changed much at all, right? It's what, 33 sections. And I think we have, what, you know, two, two editions. One is a technical one. And, you know, so really um, have not done much at all, but I, I, I think it's better to go through section by section or at least have that whole thing in front of the body instead of doing instances of the of amendments because it just it gets trickier to you know have people go to the original bill and try to figure it all out so um so i think it looks more complicated than it really is but the hope was just to um give people all the information and uh, and then ask us questions hopefully before we get to the floor so everybody will be able to find it this time. <laughs> I hope so. So it should be on the uh, should be on the, on today's calendar. I haven't looked at today's calendar, but it should it be. It is. Yeah, it should be on the notice calendar in entirety. And um, yes, Kelly, we will all stay in, in uh, close touch. But like I said, today I'm going to get the the summary out to to all house, and so that way I'm hoping that if folks do have questions, they can ask. And I did send the. Um, the DLS portion to um, to the um, chair and vice chair of uh, transportation, and have been in touch with um, Representative Murphy. So, all right. Um, nobody has anything else because we don't have much time before our caucus of the whole. Um, nope. All right. Great. Well, thank you, everybody, and we will adjourn and go off of.